Hi, Soyun. Hey there. Um, can you hear me? Hi. Hi, Shiva. Hi, Chef. You can't hear me. Maybe it's a good idea to call in just in case. Okay. Hi there. I can hear and hopefully you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Great. Hi there. Hey. Nice to see you again. Yeah, good to see you as well. Hi, Prague. Okay, so you and you can't hear. Um, so if you click on the... Do you have the... Um, yeah, maybe it's a good idea to, to call in in that case. There should be an option to switch to phone audio. If you click on the, the button that says mute, there's a little arrow next to it um, where you can um, switch to phone audio. Do you see that? Oops. Okay. Hey, Prague. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Good to see everyone. Yeah. So I am going to <clears throat> So I, I'm going to be just mostly in the oh goodness. I'm going to be helping to advance the slides and um, you know, helping to look at the questions and sending it. There's a Q&A button. So um, looking, following the questions and then tracking those and then sending it to you guys. Okay. Um, I, I don't really have a, a very um, strong role, I think, in this particular one. But um, yeah, let me know if there's, if there's anything that, um, that I can do to support you guys. Okay. And hopefully we'll get So Yoon back. I think I think she just um, um, <coughs> Oh and it's Soyeon. Sorry, Soyeon. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I think I think she's trying to figure out her um, audio which I hope we get to work yeah how, how do you feel about stuff chef oh I think you're muted dear yeah I am um, <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good um, I'm eager for this conversation but I am sick so oh, yeah, no. like, that's partly why I was worried about the video because I'm like I have water on one side tissue on the other <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I'm, uh, I'll try to hold it together for an hour and not cough and and uh, make a scene. I might turn my video off if I do have to like um, do any personal care. <laughs> oh no! Totally okay. Great. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry that you're sick. Ah, yeah. Mm. It's okay. No worries. It happens, right? Yeah. Where are you based? I'm out of Seattle, so I'm. Um, yeah. I our headquarters are in California. Um, right. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's a little bit lonely working out of my home office when I, and when my team is, you know, just two and a half hours flight away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we, luckily, I mean, you know, there's just a lot of uh, good tech that we can use video conferencing all the time. So, yeah. How about you guys? You're in California, right? I'm in California, but um, Prague is, um, Prague's on the East Coast. Oh, okay, okay. I am, I am. Yeah, I'm uh, in the DC area, although I, I would say Baltimore, but I'm not, I'm not in Baltimore. <laughs> so you're also a, a team that's across the globe. <laughs> yeah, um, and then also, um, Yvonne, like with your position, you're, you're more familiar with this too, right? Yeah, so I, I recently started um, a gig with Bali, and mm -hmm. um, they're also based in Oakland as well, um, but I, I'm based out of Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, an hour flight south. Okay, yeah. It was great to be in LA um, for the conference. Yeah, it was, it was really... Oh, sorry, go on. No, I was just impressed by the LA co-op 
you know, community coming out and really just, they were strong. It was great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm curious, I'm trying to ch open my chat window and I'm not able to open the chat window, nor am I able to open the Q&A. I don't know if it's because we're not technically broadcasting, if those features are just not available to us, but I'm wondering if either of you are able to, to click on that. Yes, I am. I just sent a test chat. Me too. I see progs. Oh, they're so you. Oh, we see you. Do you have a headset in, um, Soyan? No. Dang, that's too bad. Um, I would recommend calling in. Um, so there was a phone number attached to the invitation. Yeah. Um, so if you can, can you hear us? Oops. Um, oh, here, now I see the chat and the Q&A. Okay, I think it was hidden because um, Huh. So line is playing recording. Okay. So I think what's happening is that the call in line maybe won't be active until we actually start broadcasting, which we will start to do in like two minutes. Um, so I would stay maybe dialed into that call in line. Um, it's too bad that, yeah, thank you for pasting that in, Chef. It's yeah. too bad that, um, that the computer audio isn't working. Um, you know, if it's okay with you, maybe I will, I will start broadcasting now. And so soon, could you, um, are you dialed in to the, um, let me just type. Are you dialed in to the phone line now? Hmm. So she can't hear us either? No, it doesn't sound like it. That's weird. Hmm. Can you hear us? Um, okay. All right, what do we do? Um, let me see if there's anything. Okay, let me see if I change her role as the co-host, if that makes a difference. I mean, right now she doesn't have a microphone attached to. Yeah, maybe that will help. Her phone. Um, I, I think, okay, this is the same number, can't hear us. Just, just give me one minute. I'm gonna start broadcasting us, okay? Cause it's a minute too anyway. Okay, so let me, let me type <coughs> I'm going to start broadcasting. Stay on the phone line and you should hopefully start to hear us. Okay, good luck everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Yoon, can you hear us? Can you hear us now? Did this did this happen when you guys were trying the um, when you guys were trying out the 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 rehearsal? You need a participant ID. Ah, okay. Was there? I don't think we tried. Yeah, we didn't test it in the rehearsal. Do you think you called in as an attendee? Okay. There is a participant ID in that email you sent us. It's 26. Okay, I think it's different for each of us. Um, okay, we do have some folks um, signed on as um, attendees right now. Welcome everyone, just bear with us. We're dealing with some technical issues. 
because one of our panelists is having a hard time getting their audio to work. Um, I will troubleshoot with Zoom um, via the chat, but Prague, why don't you go ahead? We are broadcasting right now. Okay, um, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us for the fourth of um, our five-part webinar series for 2018 with the Asian American Solidarity Economies um, Project. And uh, my name is Parag Kandar, uh, along with Yvonne Liu. Uh, we co-facilitate this webinar series uh, in the interest of introducing modalities and different ways in which um, Asian migrant communities um, and individuals and um, working within communities have been looking at the whole range of different solidarity economies um, possibilities um, from cooperatives to mutual aid um, to uh, intersections with the gift economy and a whole range of other things that um, are really fascinating and happening throughout um, Asian migrant communities in North America as well as um, sort of ancestral um, understandings of how um, these different um, possibilities um, have worked for generations. So um, we uh, are really excited about our um, guest today. Um, we um, will have a conversation um, with our two guests um, discussing um, both um, looking at um, small businesses and micro enterprises within um, within uh, uh, the United States uh, with uh, an understanding that um, for Asian American communities, um, um, owner operating uh, or owner operators for um, micro enterprises and small businesses, uh, it's a, a very significant um, way in which community members um, are able to provide their own income for their families and also um, to move forward in, in different ways within, um, within their communities. Um, and then also that small businesses, um, uh, and our guests will talk a little bit about the distinctions and, and you know, what, the, what these different terms mean. Um, that uh, working for yourself, working for your, you know, with your family, um, hiring uh, people within your community um, is something that um, through the different ways in which people have come to the United States um, and also the challenges with the traditional workforce in the United States, um, it's something that's very um, prevalent within um, migrant communities generally and then Asian uh, migrant communities in particular. So we're really excited to um, have a conversation about some of the ways in which these traditional, um, what's called legacy, sometimes called legacy um, small businesses and micro enterprises um, already um, ex um, explore and kind of work um, through mutual aid and cooperation um, and also other like more formal ways in which they might be able to do that, do that um, from converting from a traditional um, owner or small uh, set of owners um, in, a, in a small business to um, having the workers um, uh, purchase and, and operate their own business uh, or the, uh, an existing business to um, looking at micro enterprises that um, are in a city or in an area and how they could work together, how they already work together, and how they could work together even across sectors. So without further ado, um, I wanted to introduce um, uh, our first guest. Um, actually, is the audio working? Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Yvonne, for, for magic. <laughs> so um, our first guest is Soyan Park. Uh, Soyan Park is an organizer, a trainer, an organization builder, and a movement strategist. Soyan's 25-year history in youth and community organizing in predominantly black and brown communities, and her own background growing up as a daughter of a Korean small business owner, brought her to the work that she's doing today in the area of community economic development with the Micro Business Network. In her own evolving race analysis and to find the positioning and role of Asian Americans by centering their experience, her work with Korean and immigrant shop owners and Black residents begins to forge understanding, healing, and power building to fight anti-Blackness and racial triangulation in city policies. Thank you, Soyan. We really look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> if you can. Sure. Um, thank you, Parag. Um, I'm excited to join you all and 
share a little bit about um, uh, from a perspective that um, is often left out of the U.S. dialogue on race and how it applies to the perception of Asian Americans in business. Um, two of the topics I'll touch on um, highlight the struggle that Korean store, uh, um, corner store owners and liquor store owners face from the community and from the city. And the other way is the ways in which we can cooperate and collaborate to address issues impacting them at the core. Um, in the last half century, uh, Chinese and Korean shop owners have dominated the small corner store and liquor store community in urban centers. Um, this can be explained partly by uh, racialized immigration policies and barriers to economic opportunities. Um, the setting that shop owners find themselves in, typically in poorer neighborhoods where they may be the only store around, can be explained in part by racialized zoning policies and the not denial of public reinvestment as formerly economically integrated and thriving black communities began to see black middle class flight in the, um, into the suburbs. Um, so the container for this story is, and I'm going to use a political science term, um, the hyper ghetto. Um, and the main character that I will be talking about today is the newly arrived Korean or Chinese immigrant who finds themselves taking on the existing convenience store or liquor store in that neighborhood. Um, it's important to dissect the social and economic policies and set them within the context of history to see the full picture. Um, the racial tensions and the conflict is reflective of much more than not speaking each other's language or culture, understanding culture. Um, when we look at the conditions of Blacks left behind in the hyper ghetto and the uncertain real reality for um, a new immigrant leaving behind war or conflict in their homeland, there's much more at play than the cultural misunderstanding between two racial groups. Um, uh, fast forwarding to 2015, um, the death of Freddie Gray by the Baltimore Police Department um, set off uh, a week of anger and despair, um, resulting in destruction. And because many of the neighborhood stores um, which were targeted uh, were within black communities, um, and because nearly 75% of them were owned by Koreans or Chinese, this sector of the business community faced the most destruction. Um, even if the Asian store owners were not the first ones to open that liquor store in a given neighborhood, it was nevertheless seen by black residents as not supporting the health and uplifting the community, um, which had seen better economic times. Um, a city policy soon passed thereafter um, to set a new standard for the number of liquor stores in residential areas. Um, Korean and Chinese shop owners um, may be forced to close businesses that they have had for 30 or 40 years. Um, at the same time, the state liquor board was still selling liquor licenses within the city limits, um, and primarily to gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, which categorized their liquor stores as wine and spirit businesses. Um, in a new effort, Asian shop owners and black residents are forging an alliance to push the um, state to transfer existing liquor licenses to maintain a cap on liquor stores. Um, through this work, Korean shop owners and black residents um, are beginning to take the first steps in understanding and healing. Um, I'd like to share briefly a few examples of shop owners, or um, I like to call them micro businesses or micro enterprises, um, because the definition of a small business is any business with fewer than 500 employees. Um, and the business my father and other Asian immigrants typically have um, rarely rise above a few employees and have a completely different financial experience than businesses with 25 employees, let alone 500. Um, the first example is that through the racial healing work between black and Asian communities, 
we are seeing Korean corner store owners working with urban farms in the neighborhoods to supply fresh fruits and vegetables to residents who've been living in food deserts um, without access to healthy food. Um, this is one example of cooperation and it links the Asian shop owner with the urban farmer who is typically um, white or black but usually lives in the neighborhood and serves the black resident who faces the struggle of having limited access to healthy food. Um, another example of cooperation is the coming together of Asian shop owners and other micro businesses to forge an alliance against gentrifying business districts where corporate and big box stores come in and completely turn over um, the economic landscape. Um, these micro enterprises are coming together to find ways to stay competitive and reduce costs and build power. Um, two of the ways we're reducing costs, we're utilizing community purchasing, um, bringing together 10 or more micro businesses. We're able to solicit lower bids from vendors, such as trash collection or linen services or pest control. Um, this way we can demand lower prices, um, but as big business does when just as big business does when they come together. Um, we're also creating our own product by micro businesses for micro businesses. Um, one strategy is in merchant services. Um, the fees that businesses pay per transaction to the credit card company, um, firstly, that fee is reduced, and secondly, that fee is split. So half of it goes to the program to operate and sustain this service, um, and the other half is returned to the micro business member in annual dividends. Um, we find ways to strengthen our own community of small businesses. Um, we're already entrepreneurs, um, and we can become the businesses to handle the middleman services we've often had to pay for. Um, we had to get creative because at this time in Washington, D.C., um, there had been a slew of workers' rights bills passed that were increasing taxes and shifting profits for the smallest businesses. Um, at the same time, there were big developers creating skyrocketing commercial rents um, over the course of just a few years. Um, micro businesses were getting squeezed on both sides, and we did not want to be anti-worker or anti-health insurance for all, um, or even anti-renewable energy. Um, but we did have to find a way uh, that worked for us to support and make these progressive choices. Um, organizing micro business owners and splitting this monolithic conservative business community and finding ways to work in cooperation were key. Um, so another example, the policy to limit liquor stores in residential neighborhoods, um, it had a clause to shut down nuisance stores. Um, so if there were three complaints against a store, it could be padlocked, and the owner would have had to wait a month or two for a community hearing. Um, anyone who has owned a corner store in a poor neighborhood knows that a snowstorm or um, one-day power outage can set your profits back, and it can take quite a bit of time to make up. Um, so not only is this a problem, but the complaints um, are not necessarily for suspected, suspected drug activity, but often just for loitering. Um, sometimes this means more than five children after school coming to the store to buy a snack. Um, so the complaints are made to the police department who track the calls um, in order for the store owner to show that they're not complicit in any perceived illegal activity. They also must call the police to register a complaint. Um, this pits black residents against Asian shop owners, um, and on top of that, brings in more police to an already over-policed community. Um, this example of pitting communities against each other um, is called racial triangulation. Um, it promotes anti-blackness and maintains these heightened racial tensions in the community. Um, this is city policy, and this is how it gets operationalized at the neighborhood level. Um, so that's one example of changes that we're working on. Um, 
Another is the work of micro businesses to demand better utility rates and renewable energy options. Um, public utilities like electricity or natural gas are regulated by the Public Service Commission. Um, and in DC, small businesses pay as high a rate or higher rates than the federal government, the university system, the hospital network, and even big businesses. Um, because they all have lobbyists to represent their interests and small businesses often don't. Um, the Office of People's Council, which is a quasi-governmental agency in DC, and there's also typically represents low-income residents, seniors on a fixed income, or public housing complexes. Um, they protect the interests of lower income residential customers. Uh, right now we're working with them to include commercial customers who are also on the lower economic end. Um, this year, we won concessions from Pepco, uh, Potomac Electric and Power Company, um, whose parent company, Exelon, is the largest electric holding company in the US. Um, these are just a few examples of cooperation among micro businesses to build power, to create racially and economically um, just communities. Um, whether it is business owners or workers or immigrants, um, the principle here has been to use organizing to build collective power, to address problems at their root and design solutions, which begin to mirror the world that we are fighting for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, there is so much in what you've shared um, that um, I'm looking forward to our unpacking that a little bit. Um, so um, I, I, I forgot to actually mention two things. One is that um, you're based in the DC area and that you're working in DC and Baltimore um, currently with the Micro Business Network. Um, so hey neighbor. And then um, the other thing uh, is to just invite um, all the participants um, who and attendees who are um, who are with us, um, please feel free to um, uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll try to respond to them if it makes sense to pose them um, for a discussion, we'll do that. Um, you know, if it's something really specific that, um, that one of us could respond to via the Q&A that everyone can read, we'll do that as well. So please, please feel free to um, send your questions in and we'll have some time at the end for Q&A as well. Um, but thank you, Soyan, we'll, we'll circle back with you in a little bit. Um, and uh, it's very exciting to hear about this work. Our second guest um, is Shivanti uh, Daniel Rapkin. We're super happy um, and excited to have uh, Shivanti here. Shivanti is a co-director of the Cooperative Conversions Program at the Democracy at Work Institute, DAWI. Her uh, work scans over 15 years in community and labor organizing and strategic capacity building with nonprofit and small businesses, nonprofits and small businesses. She previously served as lead manager of uh, Worker Cooperative Initiative at Pincho uh, University, Center for Inclusive Entrepreneurship, and helped develop a cooperative management certificate program. So welcome, Shivanti, and thank you so much for being here uh, with us. Excellent, Prague. It's great to be here, and it's wonderful to um, be part of the conversation. Thanks, Sayan, for your um, uh, words of wisdom. I, I learned a lot, and I'm I'm eager to get into the Q and A uh, <laughs> so that we can we can dive in. Um, wonderful. So it sounds like you can hear me okay. Um, it, for the audience, you'll have to bear with my um, scratchy voice or potential cough occasionally. I uh, have a cold. Um, so. I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, the mid-sized to larger businesses in uh, communities of color. Uh, so Yen mentioned um, she focused on the micro businesses. We're um, uh, the Democracy at Work Institute is um, a organization that helps build the field of worker-owned cooperatives, and more recently we've partnered with. Um, TA providers and lenders from around the country that are part of a collaborative called Workers to Owners. It's a team of folks that are interested in converting existing businesses to worker-owned cooperatives. Um, and this is also in conjunction with efforts to um, reduce displacement because of gentrification or cost increases in our cities. Um, and it's an opportunity to really think about how we bring in municipal leadership that are looking for new economy strategies, but are also um, trying to find viable ways to retain the businesses that they already have. 
should I be advancing these slides? Okay, great. So um, that's just a quick slide on the organizations um, that are uh, part of the partnership. So this this is actually a um, post a, um, a note that was posted on a local business um, saying you know they're they're closing um, for for various reasons but one of the key reasons was that the owner was uh, retiring and he was unable to find a owner um, and their children didn't want to take on the business this is a um, not a unique problem we're actually seeing um, a lot of um, businesses closed that are viable, that are employing people, um, and oftentimes um, uh, could be preserved and, and retained. And so um, from a national perspective, as we see this happen around the country, we really think that there is a strategy that is starting to be modeled and tested and tracked uh, that, that could be replicated um, in cities across the U.S. So, for example, as a small business owner exits the workforce, they're often faced with several questions around who continues their business, right? One option is that they close the business, um, which leads to job loss. The other option is to sell to a third party. Um, and this is if you have a strong, viable business, the third party potentially um, is interested in buying it. But oftentimes that also could lead to job loss. Um, then the last option is keeping the, the business and the family. And as many of you uh, might already know, this is oftentimes um, rife with, with issues. Um, uh, you know, the data shows that only about a third of family owned businesses actually endure uh, to the second generation. And we are starting to see that m many of our um, families are um, have kids that have moved on to other career paths and taking on the family business might not be the best option. So we really feel like becoming employee owned is a solution um, to keep those businesses open um, and to retain those jobs and transfer ownership uh, to a um, to the employees great if, uh, great um, the business closure impact is is a is a real thing. Um, people are starting to pay attention and um, we've now uh, begun to see several uh, academic research reports come out. Um, this is kind of a dense slide I, I realize, but um, something to keep in mind that I'll be focusing mostly on baby boomers and uh, business owners and about 10,000 business owners um, or 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day, right? And this is expected to continue through 2030. When we look at the baby boomer generation, um, they're, they are the large majority of business owners. About 67% of the businesses in America are owned by boomer uh, generation um, owners. So there will be a major transfer of ownership um, and it's, it's the largest ever in the history of the United States. Over uh, uh, 10 trillion in assets could potentially be uh, transferred over. Um, a recent report that was published this year by Capital Impact Partners and the ICA group shows that about 83% of the regions they studied um, and surveyed uh, would uh, were closing back in 2012 to 2016, closed due to the owner's retirement. And these were businesses that were reporting annual incomes of upwards of 600,000 a year. Um, so these are these are not your small mom and pop shops, but they are your mid-sized businesses, and they're often in in industries that are um, employing people of color um, and or owned by people of color. This report specifically focused on uh, regions in the Northeast, New York, Mid-Atlantic, and then the California area. So the impact is real, and um, as we dive into these numbers, we really start to see how. Um, the pressures of gentrification are adding um, uh, 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 tensions in our community where people are moved um, and displaced. Um, the lack of good transportation also affects uh, our communities. But then, second, and then there's this added layer of businesses that really have been providing services in a community that rely on it um, or are potentially. Um, um, have the closure impact um, as a potential part of uh, the next stage of their their business. So we want to mitigate this. Um, and that moves me to the next slide, which uh, really looks m uh, the more delineated number of uh, how how 
POC businesses will be affected. So looking at the data from the U.S. Census, we found that about 900,000 uh, businesses are owned by people of color. That's a trillion in sales, 7 million people uh, that are employed by these businesses. If uh, of these 900,000, we're seeing that, you know, 284,000 of them have owners nearing retirement and 83% do not have a succession plan. So that's a major concern. Um, again, this is uh, now starting to be on the radar, not of just organizers in our communities and co-op developers in our communities, but we are starting to see city municipalities start to pay attention. Oftentimes city municipalities only uh, really do focus on um, startups and um, the growth sector, but they're not looking at business preservation and succession planning. Um, okay. So you compound this issue of the closure impact with the racial wealth divide, which you all are very familiar with. The, the loss of these businesses will further exacerbate racial and economic disparity. This is a graph that specifically shows um, uh, Black and Latino uh, wealth in relationship to white um, wealth. But the next slide actually shows a, another uh, report that just got published in, in this year um, of, of Asian wealth. Oftentimes, Asian wealth is not included in this sort of um, um, demographic mapping of, of wealth inequality because we have such a spread um, in terms of Asian wealth it being equal to that of um, white wealth. But what we've seen in the last year of this uh, Pew Research Center report is that uh, while over overall Asians uh, rank at the highest earning racial and ethnic group in the US, they are um, today income inequality is rising most rapidly among Asians. So between the top 10% and the bottom 10%, there's the widest gap. Um, and this is something that we really need to sort of hone in on and, and pay attention to. Um, and in my work, as we work with larger mid-sized businesses, um, we, we, we're starting to realize that this, that this community of people that are in the um, lower part of the income bracket are, are being missed. And, um, and this is an opportunity for us to really think about how, how do we um, uh, begin the conversation in, in these communities and how do we start, um, you know, using our organizing um, ability to, to, to be in front of these business owners and really talk to them about the potential of selling uh, their business to, to their employees. So with these sort of dual problems, we believe that there is a opportunity. Um, and if you, um, you, you know, if you're an optimist, um, you, I always see a, a fine line, a, an opportunity when there is a challenge. Um, from the sectors that we've looked at where there is the highest employment um, of people of color and then um, and the highest growth potential, these are the critical industry and sectors that we're saying if we're to do a targeted approach around preserving legacy businesses in our neighborhoods and working with cities directly or uh, city organizers, um, uh, figuring out those grocery stores, the manufacturing plants, uh, um, home care agencies and reg residential care facilities. Those are areas where we've seen uh, large numbers of um, uh, uh, people of color being employed in those industries as well as um, people of color owning uh, businesses in those industries. I don't want to miss out on child care construction and manufacturing. These are definitely also um, a major areas of growth. Um, and specifically, I want to say that the strategy to convert a business um, has two potential impacts on the workers. One is in industries where there is um, high growth, high revenue, um, there is a potential for um, asset growth and wealth building uh, for employees that take over ownership, right? So this strategy could help build wealth. But in areas where, um, like child care and or um, home care, where wages might be low, this really, it, it may not help build wealth in the way that we're seeing uh, it in other industries, but we do see that it helps create stability. Uh, it, help create, it helps create um, a decision-making uh, um, and ownership over uh, their day-to-day -day work. And that dignity is important and it's as valuable as, as the increase in wages or wealth. Um, so these are the critical industries that we think if targeted 
and and done is a concerted effort in 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 conjunction with um, leadership in, in our city municipalities as well as um, uh, on the ground uh, technical assistance or business TA providers. I think there we could actually make a dent um, in these sectors. Um, so when we when as we began this work um we brought together ta providers or technical assistance providers that are familiar with employee ownership and cooperatives this was several years ago we've studied different models that have come out of um of the esop world as well as the cooperative sector and we've um, really determined that a hybrid form is an interesting um, approach for businesses that have already been um, in operation. Uh, transitioning to a true cooperative or a ESOP may not be the best option, but something in between is the more likely um, result of, of, um, of conversions. And that's what we're seeing in these employee-owned converted businesses is a, is a mixture. And um, we've learned a lot from our partners in the Workers to Owners Collaborative. It, it includes uh, groups that are uh, lenders um, in the space, as well as TA providers and co-op developers. Um, and all of these folks have um, begun to build a network that uh, that, that is um, formalized through the ba uh, my organization, Dowie, being a backbone and helping to support a standardization approach so that we can scale this as a strategy that can be used around the country. Um, so as we sort of uh, think about how you all interact with uh, local businesses or, or in your work, um, if you run across employees or um, owners that are interested in succession planning, they're starting to think about exit planning, they may not have options. Um, they need to start thinking about the, uh, the employee ownership option and places that you can go to for help um, is at this website, Becoming Employee Owned. It allows for a business owner to really understand and assess whether they're ready for something like this. And then it gives an opportunity for them to also connect with the right professionals that can help um, make the transaction um, happen and, and potentially restructure the company as a worker-owned cooperative. Um, so it, it, this is um, this is an important role that will require a concerted and coordinated effort across several organizations, agencies, um, and so it's not to be taken lightly um, or done by one individual with no other um, support. It, it, so I encourage anyone that is curious to go onto this website and just kind of know if there is a provider or a person that you can work with uh, locally in your community if this is a strategy that is of interest to you. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Avanti. That is uh, of so much information um, that is super relevant um, for the um, um, individuals who are working with um, the range of different Asian American communities um, throughout the uh, nation. And also for people, I think, um, who are interested in organizing strategies. Uh, and I think that that is one of the interesting places where there um, you know, is intersection and, and also um, the, the presentations that you both have, have made um, are really interesting. I think often when we uh, see traditional issue-based organizing, you know, business owners are not really part of that matrix. Uh, business owners are doing fine, right? And um, they're often the employers, so they're the target. <laughs> and so um, I wanted to just ask a quick question. Um, and uh, before I um, do that, I just want to invite more questions. We have one question, um, which um, uh, actually one question that came in was um, to clarify, uh, Shavanti, on your side, does it mean that Asians have more wealth in the U.S. than uh, white people? Well, at the top, um, at the top of the 10 percentile, uh, uh, they are equivalent uh, and or uh, in, at par. Um, but when you look at the bottom, uh, there's a, the, the divide is, is, is wide. That's the main thing about that piece of uh, that data graphic. Great. Thank you. Um, and, um, and we know that, uh, I mean, uh, people who work in Asian American communities know that, you know, disaggregating the data is so vital because, um, as Soyan had mentioned, you know, immigration um, patterns, who was allowed into this country, who was excluded from this country, um, are also, um, 
you know, uh, contribute to the, the range of uh, different opportunities that different community members have had. Um, and so uh, when you disaggregate the data for Asian communities, there was 50, you know, more than 50 different communities throughout the country, um, the, the data is all over the map when it comes to wealth and community wealth. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so I was um, asking about workers' rights. So workers' rights um, are a longstanding organizing concern in Asian migrant communities, as you both know. Um, and traditional organizing has taken the view that, um, you know, business owners are the targets. Um, but there are often members of the same communities or communities of color, um, you know, um, and, um, you know, while some are quite abusive, um, sometimes uh, we've heard that community micro uh, business owners or small business owners are actually sometimes more understanding of some of the workers' needs, their whole family needs and, and other aspects of, of their whole lives. Um, so, uh, and more, more understanding than some of the bigger companies. So how do you see your respective work as advancing workers' rights? Um, and also, um, you know, how do you, how do you balance that with recognizing the nuances and complexities of intra-community sort of, you know, work? Um, when we have, uh, you know, a variety of um, immigration patterns and also, or migration patterns and also um, class, um, you know, matters within our communities. Yeah, I can jump in first. Um, I definitely uh, have had personal experience um, with what you're talking about, um, the divide between the owner and the, the worker uh, coming from a labor organizing background. Um, that's where I spent most of my time before I got into the co-op sector. And I think this is something real. We have to um, um, address this. Um, oftentimes we do hear owners um, who are start curious about um, transitioning ownership, uh, they oftentimes will say, well, will my, will the employees be uh, prepared? And, you know, are they capable? They have a, a lot of sort of um, paternalistic, right, um, uh, commentary that comes out. Um, the other, the other element is that oftentimes we also find that we're, the workers might be um, nervous when, when they hear about uh, ownership. They start to think, well, does this Put me at risk. What what does this mean? Do I you know do, does it um, uh, impact um, you know uh, the the my ability to stay um, mobile right or my ability to leave this job etc. So there are definite fears on both sides that come up when when we start talking about employee ownership to to the owner or the the in this case the buyer the employees. Um, when when I think about the work that. Uh, folks are doing out in the world uh, around the co-op sector, the, the, especially with the conversion to employee ownership, we do start, traditionally, we are starting with the owner uh, because oftentimes the financing of the deal is, um, has to be initiated by the owner um, and or is oftentimes financed by the owner. And so it is a very particular type of owner that is interested in this. They care about their legacy and they have some sentiment that they feel connected to their workers. They're, um, they, they feel like um, uh, passing on this legacy is an important um, uh, thing to do. Um, and so I, I, I oftentimes hear from owners where they, they specifically talk about uh, workers that have been with them for 10, 15, 20 years, and um, and it's created a camaraderie, even though there still might be tensions, uh, you know, across. And so, from our strategy, we think it's important um, to to bring the owner in and really have an owner that has buy-in and sees value in in transitioning ownership to the employees, and then secondarily, as as soon as possible, bringing in the um, workers to. To begin to think about what does this mean for for them as workers? How does this change um, uh, the dynamic? Getting them to understand the, the the not just the management side of the business, um, but the um, the the risk side of the business, right? So what once they take on uh, this risk, what does that actually mean um, for them as workers? So that education piece is probably the one the, the most ethical piece of our work where we try it's not just a, a legal transaction and a handoff of the business which you could do in three to six months but it's the one to two years of um, direct work with employees um, to really get them to a place where they feel equipped and confident but also that they have the supports necessary to create a governing system that is, is more democratic 
um, and then does engage the race class um, issues that they've already been dealing with in their workplace. Mm. Thank um, you so much. Mm -hmm. And um, to maybe add a different piece to this question, um, when Washington, D.C. was raising the minimum wage, um, I think it was the time when we raised it to 1250, uh, and, and now it's up to 15. But, um, but the first fight, uh, we did find small business owners um, who supported the raise. And one of my micro business owners um, said that she was getting $11 an hour, um, just like her employee. Um, and when it went to 12, that they would both, you know, get a raise. Um, that she was in it with, you know, she and her worker uh, were in it together. Um, building up this brand new business. Um, uh, I think in 2016, um, there was a, um, a campaign for um, paid family leave in DC. Um, and the, one of the strongest policies in the um, country was passed uh, in, in, I think, December in 2016. And um, there were uh, quite a few small business owners um, that supported it. In addition to small business chains like um, uh, Mom's Organic Market and Ace Hardware, um, but also um, a lot of independently owned, locally operated small businesses supported it too. Um, and one of the reasons was it created a, um, a fund at the city level that anybody, including the employer, could draw from if they needed paid family leave. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's, it's not, the owner is not just an owner. They also tend to work there, um, especially when we're talking about micro businesses. Um, I think the only piece is that oftentimes um, small business owners or small business community uh, is not engaged early on um, when you know, coalitions are formed to draft legislation. Um, so one of the challenges we had was a um, uh, policy that was proposed around um, capping carbon emissions um, in the city. Um, you know, the environmental groups really wanted to go after um, corporate and big box stores that were doing the polluting and um, who, could, who could pay the fines. Um, but unfortunately, small businesses um, were also included in the mix. Um, and if there had been a way that we could have um, supported small businesses to find um, renewable options um, that were more affordable um, or accessible, um, it could have been a different kind of policy. Um, instead, what often happens with micro business owners is they don't often own the property. And so um, any upgrades um, or solar panels or um, other renewable options that are installed um, sometimes don't trickle down to the micro business owner, the shop owner. Um, and, you know, there's other sets of regulations around that um, that need to be addressed. Um, but I think it, you know, it's not as automatic um, the the divide between worker and owner, um, and I think we need to continue doing the outreach and the organizing um, and the education um, to build more power. Thank you so much um, to both of you. Um, I think that part of what's really exciting about um, thinking about um, these different um, ways of approaching work with small businesses and also with the workers um, and micro enterprises is that uh, once you start to, once you really start to think about um, what uh, is possible, um, suddenly it's like, it's like blooming, right? There are all these different things that are possible. Um, and, you know, part of that also takes the humility to actually listen and to say, you know, what, what are folks already doing, right? And that, you know, in small businesses, you know, with 10, 15, 20 employees um, that are fairly successful, you know, 
you, there's all kinds of innovation and interesting things that sometimes the owners are doing because they also, you know, they're, they're interested, not everyone, but they're interested in retention. They're interested in, um, you know, those relationships, uh, Shivandi, that you mentioned that, you know, last for 20, 10, 15, 20 years, but particularly when there's a client facing, customer facing side to that um, and it's neighborhood based. And understanding some of that nuance and understanding you know, where the institutional memory lives and, and um, that, that there's a, you know, some vested interest for, um, particularly as we're looking at, um, you know, Asian migrant communities, you know, starting a business in a neighborhood and being there for a long time, getting successful and then recognizing, hey, you know, my kids don't want to actually take on the shop. They, they have other plans, you know, they actually have the ability to do other things now and they don't want to do this shop. Um, but what does that mean? I want to retire. <laughs> Um, and, you know, so um, uh, I think on the transactional side, looking at owner finance and, and looking at, you know, the sale and transition to, um, to the workers as a way of having a fixed income then from, from the sale and the transaction um, uh, is, is really interesting. And, you know, as a transactional lawyer on that side, like that's something that I'm really interested in. And or, you know, transitioning from, um, you know, an owner operated shop on a, on a corner to community ownership. Uh, within that neighborhood um, that, you know, if there's grant money or government money that could facilitate that, that maybe, you know, there's a win-win there for everyone. Um, so, um, so what excites um, each of you about one another's work and possibilities and, um, you know, potential integrations that you see? Ah, oh, wow. Um, that's a that's a big question, and uh, you know, I think w one thing when I think about micro businesses and the in particular in the co op sector is that we've seen some really um, uh, strong growth uh, in in businesses that are starting up as cooperatives, and um, where um, say uh, women are coming together and they have shared services, so they might. Um, otherwise work independent is, as a group of one or two people, but um, by, by cooperating and building shared services, they're able to, um, you know, pay for one staffer that might help with dispatch or managing the schedule or whatnot. And so we've definitely um, seen an uptick in growth over the last decade or so in businesses like that in the startup sector for co-ops. Um, what I what what I'm curious about is that you know um, as I've talked about our conversion strategy or to uh, to cities and and new places where co-ops are still kind of unfamiliar, um, in uh, especially in the immigrant communities, I've um, dealt with the question of you know in the immigrant communities a lot of the services and business needs are much more emergent like they're they're just beginning to start uh, to build a business and so um, you know is this a suitable um, method right um, uh, to, for, for some of these businesses and so for me it's like uh, trying to understand the landscape of micro business and who who is in that and how do we how do we potentially use um, cooperatives as a way to, to bring um, uh, shared services together. So childcare, for example, is one area where we, we're seeing in Chicago through the leadership of the ICA group, um, we're seeing that effort where independent uh, workers are being brought together uh, to, as a coordinated body of people and then managed uh, through some shared services or as a, as a cooperative. Um, so, and that builds a lot more power. Um, uh, both in in sort of ind independence um, and and the capacity to sort of manage uh, one's life and and share the responsibility and the risk, um, but on the other side, it also gives a stability, uh, right? It, it's um, it they can bid on bigger projects, um, potentially um, compete uh, as a larger entity, and we're seeing this both in in care different care industries, both childcare and home health care, um, which I think is really um, exciting. Um, for me, what was exciting to hear about in Shivanti's presentation is, um, you know, the long-term thinking about what to do with legacy businesses. And um, uh, a lot of the Korean-owned shops, I, you know, it, um, they all started um, 
in ownership um, around the same time, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so they're all right about that age when they want to start to retire. Um, and you're right. The children are now, I, I don't know, they're in grad school or, or they have families, they live out of state, um, you, you know, they're in other careers. Um, and so um, in Baltimore, what we found was um, there were there was an example of um, black residents um, uh, brokering deals with some of the Korean owned shops um, and, you know, ownership transferring. Um, what we'd like to do is look at that in a more intentional way um, that builds relationships with the communities. Um, and, uh, you know, address some of the challenges that had um, existed before. Um, one of the new, um, I guess, Korean owners of a Korean shop, you know, um, the owners who are retiring, um, the new Korean owner, um, they're being taken around by the old Korean owner um, who's been there for 30 years. Um, doesn't speak the best English, but has certainly built relationships um, with the neighborhood. Um, and so they want to transfer a lot of that knowledge and information. Um, one thing that the uh, owner operator micro, micro businesses that I'm working with, um, you know, folks are very excited about the prospect of um, saving money over time with the merchant services. Um, that uh, that we started to work on, um, you know, they're they're saying, you know, I've saved a little bit here, I've saved a little bit there. Um, commercial rent is something that uh, we have not worked on, um, but the next highest expense are utilities, and we're beginning to work on those. Um, so it's like, um, you know, the cost of vendors um, can be controlled, or you know, we can get more competitive bids. Um, we're tackling some of our largest expenses. Um, so one of the things they're interested in is some long-term thinking around could all of the businesses in an area go in together on, you know, a parking lot um, and raise that money and support, you know, the programs that we offer for other micro businesses, um, but also increase our ownership right but in a collective way um, and so looking at adapting some of the cooperative structures and a lot of the principles around collective ownership um, amongst um, owner operator business owners thank you um, there's so much here and it's such a rich there's so much potential for like really rich conversation here and so um, we unfortunately are almost out of time um, we do have one question that came in, um, just asking a little bit more about the alliances made among small businesses to, to develop stronger ability to com compete. And I think, Soyan, you talked about, um, you know, um, looking at some existing, like standing um, overhead costs and, and how that, you know, is one way um, to help them. Um, and then uh, the person also said, for instance, the store owners partnering with farmers who are also small businesses. Um, and also, um, you know, is there, some way you know in which cooperatives um also thinking about the cooperatives ability to be um able to be competitive and is that a factor um so is there anything there that you would like to respond to Swain? sure um uh so so the general idea is um the residents especially in poorer neighborhoods um they don't have an, a lot of access to buy goods and services unless they go out of the neighborhood. Um, so the idea is if the shops in those neighborhoods can provide some of the goods and services that are needed, you know, there's a mutually beneficial relationship there. Um, and when we bring in urban farms that are sometimes right in the neighborhood, um, you know, that's like a triple benefit. Um, the urban farmer that is usually um, just starting out, um, or even if they are a long-term business, um, you know, their lot, particularly because it's inside the city, 
um, it's not big enough that they're selling wholesale or to grocery stores or to restaurants um, oftentimes. Um, and so offering what they can to the neighborhood corner store um, is perfect. Um, we're working with the um, city planners to talk about um, to talk about how to improve some of those, um, to learn from some of the partnerships we've developed um, and see, you know, what is selling in the community, um, uh, what strategies are working and what strategies need to be revamped, um, and then sharing that information citywide. Um, but I, I, would, I would suggest either, I mean, Shavanti and I are both available to answer questions um, and um, share our email addresses. Um, but if you wanted to get involved in your community, chances are there's already a network of either urban farms or um, neighborhood associations um, or other community organizations that can help um, act as a conduit um, to bring parties together. Um, so, so that's one way that you know different communities can work together. Um, the other way, I think I already mentioned, is lowering existing costs. So, um, you know, what are your what are your biggest costs? And figuring out is it something like community purchasing that can um, address those, or is it something more like advocacy and policy? Um, for example, you know, lowering utility rates um, for small businesses. Um, you know, identifying what the problems are and how to um, tackle those. Thank you so much. Um, Shanti, did you have anything else that you wanted to add before we close out? No, it's great. Uh, Sayan, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I wanted to really, really thank Shivanti and Soyan for your wonderful um, sort of work, uh, first and foremost, and then also for taking the time to share that work with us. Um, and um, there's so much more in there. And, and so we're hoping that we'll be able to speak with you um, and uh, uh, hopefully document some of this um, and share it across the network in different ways as well. Um, and we um, have a few other things just as reminders. One is um, contact information for our speakers um, is available. Um, we'll have it available um, on the webinar website um, through solidarityresearch.org. Um, the last of the, um, the 2018 series um, is um, on November 5th. Um, so remember, remember the 5th of November. Uh, incubating uh, co-ops um, and this actually will be a really interesting conversation with um, a couple of members of Viet Lead, an organization in the Philly um, uh, metro area that is working, uh, actually uh, created a youth study group on co-ops um, to work with young people to really think through, um, you know, what are these strategies, how would they work, particularly for young people who, um, for whom college isn't the next step. Um, and um, who are working, uh, often moving into the service industry in nail salons, um, auto shops, cafes. Um, what about owning our own? Um, and so they are going to share some of their thinking from an um, a organization that actually was founded with the principles of having a non hierarchical nonprofit. Um, so it's a worker self directed nonprofit. Um, and they also do really interesting intergenerational work um, in Camden, New Jersey, with Viet Vietnamese um, elders and young people um, uh, sharing on a community farm um, setting. We also will have, um, with the farm um, context, we have um, the executive director of the Hmong American Farmers Association, um, just outside of St. Paul. Um, talking about the 130 or 135 acre uh, land that they steward. Um, with family farmers, um, with 30 or 40 years of experience on these, with these family farmers, Hmong American refugees, um, who have five uh, to 10, um, five acre or 10 acre plots um, in which they're getting long leases, 10 year um, tenure, 10 year tenure on the <laughs> land. Um, and the farms, the farmers are able to grow fruits, vegetables, uh, flowers. Uh, there's huge variety and they'll talk more about this. But the nonprofit is really um, supporting um, cooperative um, work um, through uh, connecting these farmers. Um, so um, the cleaning station, the CSA that they manage, um, selling um, you know, uh, at farmers markets and to restaurants. So really excited about um, the possibilities there. 
um, that really integrate sort of the nonprofit and philanthropic, philanthropic side um, with uh, respecting the um, self-determination of farmers while also finding a whole range of cooperative solutions and possibilities um, um, you know, across those farmers, as well as secondary um, uh, businesses. Um, the young people who are growing up on those farms, um, building out their own businesses that are farm related, but not farming. Um, so, so that'll be really exciting. So again, thank you so, so much um, for uh, joining us. Please let people know that uh, the webinars are all archived on our um, website at solidarityresearch.org as well as the uh, UCLA Asian American Studies Center. We want to thank the UCLA uh, Asian American Studies Center as well as National Capacity for their support um, in the past of these projects. Um, Yvonne Liu for um, really um, holding it down with all of the technical issues that were going on and, and making this work out smoothly, um, as well as really um, uh, envisioning what this webinar series could be. And to our wonderful speakers for the amazing work that you do to build a more just and equitable um, world. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.